Hello, good evening and welcome. Here we go once again. It is Wednesday night. Uh, Jack and I have just met the boys going out, Simon and Regan. Sounds like they had a good show. Uh, sounds like it's a bit of a heavy, heavy topic, um, which affects a lot, a lot of people, what, they, what they've just spoken about. And tonight, just to give us another little sign of that, we're going to talk about another heavy topic, but hopefully in a more nice way, hopefully. And it's going to be, what does the Bible have to say about love? I mean, talk about a wide-ranging subject. So grab your tea, grab your coffee, stay with us for the next hour and uh, be with us. It's an interactive show, so do send us in your texts and your emails. And um, I'm really looking forward to tonight. I've got my usual partner in crime, Jack. Hello, Jack. Hello. Good Hello, to be here once again. Good. Oh, good, good, good. You've done your usual thing, haven't you? Prepared for about five minutes for this show as we drove, <laughs> as we drove on the way. <laughs> no, you've, you've been hard at it today, haven't you, mate? Been hard at it. Jack? Love. I mean, they, these days, you know, in the media, on the TV, in films, it's got so many meanings, nuances, you know, ways of looking at it. It ranges all over the place, Jack, doesn't it? But biblical love, um, what we're going to look at is quite nuanced and it's quite definite in its, in its definition. Um, but love does encompass all of our lives. It's our driving force. It is, the Bible says that God is love. And uh, basically, he's perfecting us through his love. And each bit of fear that we have is because we haven't been made perfect in love, you know? So we're all on a journey of love, aren't we, Jack? We're all on a journey of knowing and understanding the perfect love that our Father in heaven has for us, you know? Um, what do you understand about love, Jack? Yeah, really, you could take any chapter of the Bible and talk about love from it, even the ones all about God's wrath, because God is a God of wrath because he's a God of love. Therefore, he hates evil and he loves what is right. So really, the whole Bible is about love. And often you see two opposite sides where the liberals just want to talk about love all the time. And they've kind of divorced it from what the Bible really says. And they said, oh, we don't need to talk about repentance. We don't need to talk about salvation. Let's just all love one another. But it's not a biblical definition of love. And on the other side, you've got more fundamentalist Christians who just, you know, it's repent or burn. and they don't talk so much about God's love, and we know that it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. Yeah. So really, when you talk about salvation and repentance, then we need God's love at the heart of it, but we need to have a biblical understanding of love. And that's what I want to do today. And so I thought it'd be useful to start by just saying what the different types of love are, yeah. because in ancient Greek, in the language, there were four different words for love. Yeah. And the first one is eros, where we get the word erotic, and that's obviously a sensual love, a romantic love. It's about physical attraction. And it does often have sinful connotations, but it doesn't have to. You know, if a man and woman get married, they're allowed to have eros. That's fine. And we don't actually see the word in the New Testament, which was written in Greek, but we see it a lot conceptually in books like the Song of Solomon, which talks a lot about romantic love in that sense. And the next one, and I don't actually speak Greek or Hebrew, I just look it up on Bible Hub and you can see all of the New Testament in the original languages. And, yeah. and so... I must admit, this next one you're going to say, I'd never heard of. Storge. Storge. When I first read it, read it I thought it said Storge because I learned Spanish well, for a year. And it, it sounds yeah. like a Russian pole vaulter. I mean, <laughs> Storge. Storge Kleshnikov. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's yeah. a different word, isn't it? But Storge just means familial love. It's between um, two spouses or between a mother and her children or a father and her children. It's love within a family, basically. And that's not in the New Testament either. But it is conceptually in the Bible in verses like Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, where it says, honour your father and your mother. That's storge. So the idea storge. behind it is there, isn't it? Even though it's not the exact word, yeah. it's the idea and the connotations that lead to it, honour your mother and father. Yeah, so yeah. they're two concepts which are in the Bible, but not in New Testament Greek. Yep. But the next one is a word in the New Testament, and this is philia, um, or philia, depending on whoever you listen to online. Yeah. Um, and that's more brotherly love. That's about close friendship, affection for someone. And a great example of this in the Bible is David and Jonathan. Yeah. They were really close friends. They really loved one another but that was a tight friendship. And this is a love you don't have towards your enemies. When it says love your enemies, it's not talking about philia. It's not talking about be best mates with those who hate you and want to kill you. Yeah. Because um, really, that's, that's different. 
I would say that's almost impossible, Jack, isn't it? To have warm and fuzzy feelings towards someone that's just burgled you. Yeah. Yeah, because that would almost be a bit weird, wouldn't it? You can still have some sense of compassion for them. Yes. And you could still desire their well-being. Yes. But you can't have some brotherly affection where you get on and do stuff together. It's just, yeah. that's impossible. Yeah, but nothing's impossible with God. So yeah. you, you just never know. But in conceptually speaking, from a human point of view, that would be a bit weird, wouldn't it? It would require them to change. Yeah. That's what, that's what it would require. But the most important love in the Bible, which is mentioned the most, I think, is agape love. And that's more self-sacrificial. And that's the love of God. The Bible talks about that a lot. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight, agape. And that's very much, it's about action. It's about the will, your intentions. It's not just a feeling. It's much more than that. And it's also important to not just look up the definition of agape in a Greek New Testament dictionary, but actually to see what Jesus says about it. Yeah. Because often he would redefine things, um, not in an irrational way and say this means this when it doesn't, but to shed more light on things and to really give us insight. So that's why tonight we're going to be looking at the scriptures, what they say about love. Oh, good man. Right, what's the first? I noticed you had quite a few um, little snippets out of 1 Corinthians, didn't you, Jack, about the nature of God? Yeah, well, 1 Corinthians tells us about what love is, and we know in 1 John it says that God is love. In fact, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So the reason that we're told to love one another is because we've been born of God, we're born again, we're new creations, and when it says born again in John 3, it can be translated born from above. We're now heavenly beings on earth. We've been changed. And the evidence of that, that we've been changed by of God of love, is that we now love as well. Yeah. You can't say you belong to God, you've been born of God and changed, and then you hate your brother. Mm. The Bible would say you're a liar and you're not of God. So yeah. it says here God is love. That is his nature, that is his being. That is why he created the universe. He wanted a bride for his son that he could love for eternity, and that could love him and worship him. And that is why we're still here. That's why God's not just destroyed us off the face of the earth, it's because he loves us. So love is absolutely central. I love that. I understand I love that one, Jack. Can I throw a spanner in the works? Lots of people that have no interest in God uh, love each other. And are really kind to each other and put love in action, put sort of ab agape love in action for their spouses or friends or sons and daughters. How does that differ from us? Because unless you're born again, as the Bible says, we're not really capable of really giving out this sort of God love, are we? How does that work? Well, I think, especially books like 1 John, which we're reading, and John speaks loads about love in his gospel and in his letters here, he speaks very much in black and white terms. You've got those who are in the light, those who are in the darkness, those who are of God, those who are not of God, those in the kingdom, out. And it says here you've got those who are of love and those who aren't. So it's talking about what defines people, what drives people. Ultimately, if we're speaking in black and white terms, if you're unsaved, you live for yourself. Yeah. You are your own God. You might make an idol and make a God, but it'll be in your own image. You know, you don't get non-Christians who make a God and think, oh, I wish God didn't think about that, I wish he thought about this. No, because they make them in their own image. Whereas Christians, you submit to God, submit to his word and his will. Yeah. Where a Christian has changed. It doesn't mean they're perfect, they still sin, but now they don't live for themselves, mm. they live for God. Paul talks about, uh, is it Paul talks about dying daily? I die daily, yeah. And um, he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So we don't always do that perfectly, in fact, we very rarely do it perfectly. Oh. But if you're talking in black and white terms, Christians now live for God, put him first, and therefore they love others and put others first. Where in the world, that's not the world view. Yeah. The world view is very much me, me, me. That's yeah. why we've just had the guys talk about abortion, where you put yourself first so much. I've read so many quotes of celebrities recently saying, if I hadn't had an abortion, I wouldn't be so successful right now. That's all about me, me, me. You don't put others first. So they're the two different worldviews: love of God and love of self. So whether we acknowledge it or not, and most of the time we don't, it's all about idolatry, isn't it? It's our motives are measured by whom we serve. 
either a transcendent heavenly father or ourselves. Yeah. And if it isn't God, then it actually is ourselves, isn't it? Even, even our hobbies are extensions of ourself and there's nothing intrinsically wrong with a hobby. You know, I've got a couple of hobbies. I, God has graced me with the ability to, to still run marathons at 51. I'm very grateful because it helps out with lots of other things in my life. But I know the driving force behind that and the ability, all good gifts come down from the Father of Lights, it's from God. Yeah. And so I suppose that is a delineation point, isn't it, isn't it Jack? It's either because we love God or because we're actually, I know, I know this sounds really harsh, but we ourselves are our own God, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point, good point. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we read in 1 John that God is love, but what is love? That's a big question for tonight and one of the most famous passages in the Bible, even non-Christians tend to like it, maybe because they don't read it so carefully, but it is 1 Corinthians 13. Yes. And I'll just read a few verses from that chapter. Go on, mate. Starting at verse 4, it says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So that's a famous passage often spoken at weddings. Yeah. And there's different ways to look at it. You could look at it from the angle of, okay, how should I live? How can I be a better Christian? You can also look at it from the angle of, this is God's character. So let's meditate on that. How does God show these attributes? And I won't go through all of them, um, but I'll just go through some of them. So in verse four, it says that God is patient. Love is patient. Yeah. God is love. So we know that God is patient. And there's a verse I referenced earlier, which says, it's 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So the reason why Jesus hasn't come yet in wrath to destroy the earth, the reason he lets non-Christians live out their full lives is because he's slow to anger, slow to judgment. He would rather that people repent and be saved. He doesn't want anyone to perish. So he is patient with us. We see that there. And he's also patient with us as Christians. Even once we're born again, we mess up all the time. But he's patient. You know, even though we slip up, he's there. He, and he picks us back up and he keeps us going. He's patient with us. Not oh, Jack, just looking over the 23 years of my walk with the Lord. Wow, the amount of times that he's tried to instill in me something that's true. And you just still doubt, still doubt. And you, <laughs> then he, he helps you again. Then he shows you again. Then he reconfirms it for the 18 millionth time. And you think... I wonder if that's still true. I wonder if that's true or not, you know. He is so patient, isn't he? He literally bears with you until, I mean, I, you know, some, I, as you know, I'm a driving instructor now, and sometimes people can't quite get what you want, want them to do, you know? And the idea is that you, obviously, I'm, I'm a patient person anyway, but, you know, if they're trying to do whatever skill they're trying to do, but they're taking five hours to try and do it, it can get quite, quite wearing because you're trying to give the same sort of commands and support support sentences and um, suggestions on how to do it and you're trying to say it in different ways um, but in the end you do run out of ways to try and help someone apart from just keep saying it and keep trying to show them you know yeah but god is so patient with us isn't and he? god's had six thousand years of rebellion on earth that's how patient he is sometimes we can't put up with someone for five minutes and he's had us for thousands of years yeah so he is very patient with us yeah and we also see in the same verse yeah. that love is kind. So God is kind. And there are so many verses you could use for that. But one I have chosen is Hosea chapter 11, verse 4, where God says, I led them, it's all about Israel, I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them and fed them. And he's talking there about his kindness to Israel. And at this point, the reason why he sent the prophet Hosea was because Israel was so rebellious and so disobedient. And he's saying, but look how kind I've been to you. Yeah. You shouldn't be like this because I released you from captivity in Egypt. I brought you through the Red Sea. When you were in the desert, I fed you, I provided for you. I was always there. I uh, cut covenants with you. I had a relationship with you. And yet you're still rebelling. 
Yeah, that's how kind God is. Mm. Israel didn't deserve that. They weren't better than the other nations. God says that. He, did, he says, I didn't choose you because you were great. He said, I chose you because I loved you. And it's the same with us. The reason we're saved isn't because we're great. It's because he loves us. So we are very lucky to have a kind God and a patient God. Because I sometimes wonder, and this is where you can get philosophical and not understand why the universe as it is, but what if we had a different God? What if there was an evil? What if Satan was really God? It would just be horrible to have a God who hates us and just wants to destroy us. Yeah. But we are lucky that for some reason God is God and he's kind and patient. It's amazing, isn't it, Jack? It is amazing. Right, next attribute in, the, in your little list. Yeah, it says that God or love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. And that's where some people go wrong. They say, just do whatever you want, just you be you, just because I love you, so just do whatever. But here, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Mm. If you're letting someone just stay in their sin, that is not loving. If you love someone, you'll call them to repentance, call them to change, because God's way is better and only God's way is right. So God does not rejoice at wrongdoing. And in Psalm chapter 5, verse 4, it says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Mm. Evil may not dwell with you. That's why for God to accept us into his kingdom, he has to change us. So number one, he forgives us, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So now we can enter into his presence because by our status and our legal position, we're not sinners. But then once that happens, he starts to change us, yeah. sanctify us, set us apart to be holy and to be without blemish. That's the bride that Jesus is coming reproach. for. And above reproach. I love that line, yeah. He wants to change us because he hates sin, hates evil, and doesn't want evil in his presence. And in that same verse, verse 6, it says that love rejoices with the truth. God is a God of truth. The Bible says that God does not lie. He says, I'm not a man that I should lie. Mm. He's above men. He is God over all the universe. So he does not lie. He loves the truth. And in Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter in the Bible, all about God's word, it says in verse 160, the sum of your word is truth. That means the essence, the heart, and the entirety of God's word is truth. So that's everything God has ever done, everything he ever says, his Bible, it is true. We can trust it. We can meditate on it, knowing that this is God speaking to us, and we can trust him. When he says, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, we can know that we actually are saved. Mm. There's no ifs, there's no buts. Oh, and he wants you to have that assurance, doesn't he? He does, and even in 1 John, he says, I'm writing to you. So that you may know. You may know you have eternal life. Mm. So God wants us to be sure, because we can be sure. Yeah. So we've got a God of truth. And Jack, if, if, if ever there's been a time or period in, in history now when people want some sort of assurance, don't they, Jack? You know, some sort of, some sort of foundation to stand on because everything is starting to collapse before our very eyes. Society is imploding. And boy, do we need to know the love of God in these days. Yeah. So much so. Yeah. Mm. Next one, Jack. Yeah, the last one in 1 Corinthians 13, in verse 8, we read, love never ends. And the reason love never ends is because God is love and God is eternal. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You know, he always was, always will be. He's outside of time. And also, God's kingdom never ends. So we read in Luke chapter 1, it's talking about Jesus, the Messiah. He's just been born in Bethlehem. And it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 33, He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And his kingdom began when he came to the earth and died for us, set up the church. Now, all who believe, whether Jew or Gentile, can come in and be part of God's people but his kingdom will be fully established when he returns. That's when he'll be here physically, he'll reign from Jerusalem. But even now, and even before Jesus came, God was still king. It's just different at different times, you know, how much it is established on earth. He was always king, and his kingdom is without end. Yeah. He will reign forever and ever. But also... That's funny, because he does reign forever and ever, but at this very moment, he's let Satan be the prince of power of the air, you know, the yeah. ruler of this world. So yeah. God is the ruler of this world, but as it happens for the moment, Satan is the small R ruler. I think of, of it as a kingdom within a kingdom. Yeah. So God rules over all, and within that, 
He's let Satan rule just for a time. Um, but ultimately, Satan can't do anything if God doesn't let him. No, everything is fed through the permissible hands of God, isn't it? Every trial, everything has to come through God's permissible hand. Yeah. Absolutely. And it says in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 23, it's still right, you know about what? God's this love. Is Lamentations 3, 23 is the only verse I know in there, and I love it. <laughs> it is the best verse. It's the best verse, isn't it? So we'll just forget all of Jeremiah's old... <laughs> if you've got a better verse in Lamentations, please let us know. <laughs> please let us know. It's probably the best. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Says, it? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So God's love never ends, yeah. his mercies never end, and that is why even though we sin every day, we know that his forgiveness is still there every day. Yeah. His love is there every day. We can wake up and we don't have to feel condemned. We know his mercies on you every morning. Beautiful. That is a massive blessing. Beautiful. Right, Jack, get your thinking hats on. Um, Christian from, Hartford, from Hertfordshire says, Evening, Mark and Jack. Love listening to your shows. Thank you. Lovely topic. My question is, many people ask why bad things happen to us. And they will blame God and ask how he can, how can he allow it when he apparently loves us so much that he even gave us his only son for us as a sacrifice. Thank you and God bless you. Why do bad things happen to us, Jack? We were discussing this in the car on the way here. Yeah. And I was saying, once you get to heaven, you will not regret any of the bad stuff that happened to you, any of the suffering. Yeah. Because ultimately, this is not our eternal state. This earth, in its current condition, is not what will be forever. God is focused on, number one, saving us, and number two, then having a relationship with us. And, you know, Jesus says how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And you could say also how hard it is for a man with an easy family life or perfect health. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, anything that causes us to pray is good because it leads us to God. And that's very hard to say when you're really suffering, when you're really being abused, when your life is really hard, you're really low. But ultimately, when you get to heaven and you've made it, you've been saved from the pit of hell, you've been saved from judgment, and you're with God for eternity in his kingdom that has no end, you'll be thankful for everything. Yeah. Because God got you there. Yeah. And we know, obviously, it's sin, the word that the world doesn't like to talk about, um, sin has caused the fall of man, the fall of creation. And so we're on a downward tra trajectory right now. When the Lord comes back, is he going to put it back on an upward trajectory and recreate everything, including our, our mortal bodies? So we know that sin and its disastrous effects affect godly people, non-godly people, you know? Mm. We've got a, before we came out, Jack, Horatio Spafford's uh, hymn was on the telly. What was it in the car? It was on, I, me and Mum were watching. I never heard it. So it must I think be it was Horatio. It is well with my son. I think it was on the telly. Me and Mum were watching just while uh, I come back from lessons, and he could sing "It Is Well with My Soul." After and, and, and we're still singing that song, however many hundreds of years later, when he just lost his whole wife and family uh, with a boat drowning across the Atlantic. Work that one out. I mean, I'm not at that level yet. I mean, I, I know I'm not. You know, it's just I'm light years from that level. But yeah, bad things yeah. happen to good people. But even in our suffering, in Psalms, it says God is near to the brokenhearted. Yeah. So it's not just God leaves you, says, right, just suffer. Yeah. So you can get to the kingdom, and then no. when you're there, no. we have a relationship. Yeah. In our suffering, God has a relationship with us, draws near to us. Yeah. Yeah, that's very important. Absolutely. To Sheila says, evening to you both. When I was born again, I used to feel discouraged with myself um, because I didn't always feel love for people. Then it was revealed to me that we choose to love. This was a wonderful awakening and makes such a difference to my life. God bless you. Love from Sheila. Thank you, Sheila. It's like we put on Christ, don't we? The same thing, we must choose to put on Christ. We have the mind of Christ, put on the mind of Christ. The Bible says to choose life that both you and your, uh, uh, your descendants may live. We choose love. And also, at the same token, we can only love really in, in equality with how much we feel loved, you know? The more we receive from our Heavenly Father, the more we're able to give out, aren't we, Jack? We can't yeah. give out of total brokenness. If we have nothing to give, you know, then we can start getting very despondent with ourselves, can't we? Yeah, and I think if you want to love someone more, pray for them. When you're really praying for someone, it will grow in your heart and love for them. So I think that's something important to do. But even before you really start loving them, at least love them practically. It's like if you don't want to give money to your church, you don't feel like it, you love your money too much, do it anyway, even though you don't want to. Even though you're not a cheerful giver, just give 
until you're a yeah. cheerful giver. And it's yeah. the same with loving people. Love them until you love them emotionally. Yeah, absolutely. So you just said basically, if you don't feel like doing it, just practically serve them anyway. Yeah. Like making mum and dad a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. I knew you'd get it. I just love your, just the way you sort things out. It's brilliant. Thanks, mate. <laughs> so, <laughs> I knew I'd make you laugh there. Sandra says, Hi, Jesus showed us the greatest love when he laid down his life on the cross. And when he said to Mary, Woman, this is your son, and said to Mary, This is your, this is your, and said to Mary, This is your, not sure, so. And when he said, Forgive them, for they don't know what they've done. God bless, guys. A lovely, a wonderful, blessed program. Safe journey home. Thank you, Sandra. Absolutely. He laid down his life. Greater love hath no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Isn't it lovely, Jack, that if you're walking around tomorrow and you feel like you've got nothing in your life, if you're in Christ, you have been bought and purchased because he loved you and he chose yeah. to bestow his love upon you. And I was just reading, funny enough, you, got, you went to Hosea there, didn't you, Jack, a little minute ago? And... <laughs> Thank the Lord for young teenage children who are internet savvy because I literally haven't got a clue, have I? And you, what did you do? You downloaded onto my phone, was it Warren Wearsby? Mm -hmm. Warren Wearsby's New Testament commentary and David Guzik's Old Testament commentary, word for word, line, line by line, and I'm just in Hosea at the moment. And wow, Jack, uh, talk about the Lord patient. Israel was off like the clappers with other gods and... It was, it was a nightmare, and the Lord was so, so patient, wasn't he? Yeah. So shockingly patient. And the passage she's used there is great for love because you see Jesus on the cross making sure that someone is there to look after his mum, Mary. That's filia. That's familial love. But he also says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. That's agape love. That's love for his enemies. So that's a great passage, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. OK, uh, I think we've got Michael here and... The other side of the coin. Thank you, Michael. If we want to love as God loves, we need to hate what God hates. And I, I, I immediately had a, um, a scripture come to mind, and I've just noticed that Michael has put it at the end. So we're on the same wavelength here. If we love God, then we need to demonstrate both sides of love. That is the side that, which reflects God's love in one part, and the other part which reflects God's righteous anger and hatred against all that is opposed to him because it is perverse and evil. This hatred is a holy hatred that runs from God's grace because it is a hatred of sin. That said, you will almost never hear Christians today talk about hatred at all as holy because they've been taught that all hatred is evil. Uh, now, most hatred is truly unrighteous, a perversion of God's love, and as such is correctly called evil. And uh, I think his name's Michael. He's quoted Romans 12, which is where my brain straight, went straight, to, uh, straight away to. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, love what is good, and Psalm 5, verse 5, the boastful will not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. So Michael's talking about there, the, I think there's, there is a problem in the modern day church now where we're so uh, seeker, seeker friendly and, and, and trying to tickle many, many years and you know having no boundaries really, um, that we often, it, everything is just about Jesus loves you. And sometimes you could just go to a sermon, all you've heard for 25 minutes is that Jesus loves you. And, even the most vile, God-hating person could come out of there with, if they've not heard anything about repentance or turning and think, well, that's handy. God loves me. If there is a God and he loves me, yeah. great. I'm off. Brilliant. So he's got a point there, isn't he, Jack? And I've just started reading John, the Gospel. And in John chapter 1, you see all about this Jesus, how he's God, how he's the Son of God, how he's the Messiah, how he's got a close union with God, how he's the King. It goes through all of these things and then in the next chapter, something happens you wouldn't expect, where he drives people out of the temple, makes a whip, and he's getting rid of all the money changers. And he's basically saying, you know, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer, and you've made it a den of thieves. And you could say, well, that's not very loving, Jesus. Why have you done that? Overturned all their tables and done all this. But it's because he is a God of love. And because he's a God of love, he hates evil. He hates it when people make church and worship all about money. And it's the same with all the money preachers, the prosperity preachers. They literally just stand there talking about money all the time. Like if you read through the Bible, it barely ever talks about money. All they talk about is money. But actually, we should hate it. And it says in that passage in John chapter 2, it says that zeal for God's house had consumed him. And it should be the same with us. We should be angry when we see people corrupt in the gospel. 
We should be angry when we see people doing evil things. But the Bible says, be angry and do not sin. So you're allowed to be angry at evil things, but don't let it cause you to sin. Yeah, amen. Good little question here for you, Jack. From, just got the letter N, thank you. Good evening, I speak to people I know well who've been brought up as Christians, but don't know God or know the Bible and don't want to be lectured about God. I was like them until Rev, Rev TV changed me completely with their teaching. How does one break through to people? Great program, thank you. Jack, how do we break through to people when we're trying to talk about God? Because like you said last week, um, unless God is really speaking to someone's spirit, you could, it looks like he's talking to a brick wall half the time, doesn't it? It, it really does. No matter how diabolical someone's life is, <laughs> it feels like no matter how much good news you give them, God loves you, God has paid for your sin. If you would like to repent, blah, blah, blah. You can have eternity with God, you can know God, you can have purpose in your life. It just goes in one ear and out the other half the time, doesn't it? Yeah. How do we break through, Jack? So Zechariah 4 verse 6 says, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And that applies to salvation as well. We can't actually save anyone. We can't convert anyone. We are simply God's vessels. He uses us to speak the truth. You know, it says, how can they believe except that they hear? So we're God's vessels so that they can hear the truth. So pray for them primarily. That is the number one thing. Pray for their salvation. God might not even use you. He might use someone else. But pray, 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 and pray for an opportunity. Because if you try and force it, it might fall on deaf ears. But if you pray and God opens up an opportunity, especially with family, it's quite hard. People are close to you. Pray for an opportunity. And then when you do get one, make the most of it. And try and... You might not have much time. Like I used to do evangelism at uni, and we'd often stand by a bridge, and sometimes you might only get a minute. Yep. So don't waste time waffling. Don't talk about things that are important but aren't central. Get in there. It's like Ray Comfort. He's brilliant at this. He'll talk to people, and you can see his, his love for them. Yeah. He's not just saying, you have to repent out of anger. He's saying he wants them to repent so they can be saved. So talk about how they're sinners and talk about how Jesus came to save sinners and go into detail on that. Amen. That's it. I Amen. Think. And you just need the Lord to quicken them, don't you, Jack? You know? Yeah. To speak to them. Wonderful. Uh, lovely, lovely text here from Anita. Thank you, Anita. Evening, Mark and Jack. Always a pleasure to see you both. God is definitely love. I couldn't walk a day without him. Oh, Anita, I'll join you on that one. I think Corinthians will always be my favourite passage about love in the Bible. And do you know what, Jack? I've just got a feeling that someone out there just needs to hear about the love of God. So Jack read it out earlier, but I'm going to repeat this, and if this is for you, you'll know it. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud. It's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, I like that one, Jack, always trusts, we're getting there slowly, aren't we? <laughs> always hopes, always perseveres, and love never fails. All right, so if you just needed that for tonight, take that and run with it, because it is the truth. God bless you both and everyone at Rev. We're blessed to have all of you wonderful people. Thank you, Anita. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, Mike says, I think that this scripture indicates, oh, Romans 2.4. Oh, we mentioned that earlier, isn't it? The goodness of God leads us to repentance. I think it's that one anyway. Oh, yeah, it is that one, yeah. Uh, I think that this scripture indicates that God draws us to himself through love. His love turns, to us, turns us to himself through repentance so that he can lavish on us the treasures of his kingdom. Thank you. From Mike, uh, Romans 2, 4, New King James, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Question mark. So he does. He leads us by his love into repentance, doesn't he, Jack? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Next bit. Yeah, so the next point I wanted to make was that Jesus was the manifestation of God's love. Jesus is God's love in the flesh, personified. And as Christians, we're not like philosophers who just work in the theoretical. We can see things practically. That's why it, we've mentioned 1 John a lot, because 1 John speaks a lot about love. And it starts by saying, you know, well, actually, I'll read it, because it's, it's a passage that you probably don't think much of. Yeah but it is important. Where is this again, 1 John? This is in 1 John chapter 1. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. 
the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is God's love in the flesh, is love that can be seen, heard, touched, spoken to, and we can't see him and have that same relationship now because he's no longer in the flesh, but he was, and one day we will see him face to face, and the love passage talks about the perfect coming and us seeing him face to face clearly. So Jesus is practical, physical, he is God's love in the flesh. And in 1 John still, chapter 4, verses 9 to 10, it says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So we were sinners, and God loved us so much that he sent his only Son. This is just John 3.16. This, yeah. is, this is basic. We all know it, but it's such an important truth. And why did he send his son? To be the propitiation for our sins. That means he satisfied God's wrath against us, because as we've already said, God hates sin and he's angry at sinners. His wrath was upon us. Jesus satisfied it. So God's wrath is no longer on us who believe because our sin has been taken. And also, propitiation also um, signifies reconciliation. So God's wrath is taken away from us and we've been reconciled to him. That's why Jesus came, and that's massive. That changes our eternal state. And then in the next verse, verse 11, we read, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So if you're struggling to love someone, just think that's how much God loved us when we were sinners, when we were his enemies, so much that even came to earth, suffered and died for us. If God loved us that much, surely we can love our enemies. Surely. The difference between us and our enemies is so much smaller than the difference between us and God. So that should be our motivation. And not just love, but forgive as well. Yeah. yeah. I often think, Jack, how much has God forgiven me over these 51 years, you know? Yeah. It's never ending. Exactly. It's never ending. To drive that home, another passage, Romans 5, yeah. verses 6 to 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So it calls us weak, it calls us ungodly, and it calls us sinners, yet Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. That's how much he loves us. And that's why, like we've already said, 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Amen, Jacko. Love it. Okay. Emails and texts coming in. Thank you so, so much. Thanks, Mark and Jack. It's such a good program tonight. I'm just soaking it all in like a sponge. I will listen again and look up the various references that you gave. Praise God that he loves us with an everlasting love. Amazing, Jack, isn't it? We can actually rest easy that we have now laying in the arms of God with an everlasting love. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Wonderful, isn't it, Jack? Absolutely wonderful. Sean says, hi, guys. Seeing that you're on about love, why do you not read the book of Solomon? Uh, it seems to be avoided in the church. Sean, um, yeah, do you know what, Sean, we're just, uh, Vicky and I have just been reading through the Song of Solomon and we're doing a bit of a Zoom uh, meeting, uh, like a, I don't, you, know, you know how good I am on the web, I ain't got a clue, but one of those things, um, and we've just been doing Song of Solomon with, uh, with Pastor Alan, so, yeah, mm -hmm. really good stuff, you know, really get a lot out of there. Um, yeah. yeah, but you're absolutely right, you never hear that preached on in church, do you, Jack? Have you ever heard it? I'm just being serious, haven't uh, No. No? Never. No, absolutely. Thank you, Sean. No idea why it's a... Uh, um, right, dear Mark and Jack, I've been freed from drink and drugs after 40 years. Praise Jesus, it took a while, but God never gave up on me and I kept coming back to him time after time. It's almost like the, the woman seeking justice from the judge, remember? Was that the one in one of those parables? Par parables. Uh, one of those parables, he kept coming, she kept coming back, but just wouldn't give him peace, would she? And in the end, he gave, him, gave her what she wanted. Um, I kept coming back to him time after time. I love him now more than ever. Tell all the addicts to keep coming on back boldly to him. He loves us very dearly. I've only found out, find, found out that after all my struggles with addiction. Praise Jesus, all is well with my soul. Tom from Ireland. Bless all my dear brothers and sisters. 
John Jack, if that was the only email we got tonight, that's enough to, to warm you up, isn't it? Mm. About that. Thank you so, so much. Brilliant stuff. Um, right, next one, Jacko. Yeah, one last point on Jesus as a manifestation of love. One really great passage, really popular, is Romans 8, verses 38 to 39. It says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it says the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How do we know God loves us? Well, he was the channel. He's how we've seen God's love. He's how we know God's love. Without Jesus, we can't really have access to God's love. Not in a relational way. We see that God shows love to all humankind by sending rain and letting the crops grow and giving them life. Yeah. And the psalmist often says, you know, why, Lord, do the unrighteous have it so good? We see God's love in his provision for them. But in regards to relationship and knowing God, we only have that through Christ Jesus. And this love, no one can take that away. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that's so good because as Christians, we're not perfect until we receive our new bodies. And you don't have to be perfect to be saved because nothing can separate us from the love of God yeah. in Christ. If we're believers, we have God's love. And if you wait till you're perfect to be saved, you'll be waiting forever, won't you? Yeah. Literally forever. Mick says, hi, Mark and Jack, great program. There's theologians who say one can't love anybody unless one loves himself. I beg to differ, as Jesus said, unless one hates oneself, one is not fit to be his disciple. Um, the US Bill of Rights should not instance, instance the, the pursuit of happiness, but the pursuit of one, one's neighbour's happiness. Um, from Mick, that was an interesting line from the Lord, wasn't it? Thank you, Mick, uh, about unless you hate yourself, you're not, you're not really fit to be one of my disciples. What did he mean, do you think, by that, Jack? Well, often, like, especially with Hebrew idioms, it talks about love and hate. Like, Jacob, I loved, Esau, I hated. And the purpose of that is just to provide extremes. So it's not actually about hating yourself, because, you know, if God loves you, how can you hate yourself? But about denying yourself, rejecting yourself and putting others first. And that's so hard to do. I almost never do that. But that's what it means. To hate yourself is to put others first, to deny your needs. And, you know, some people say, oh, to love others, you've got to love yourself. But really, we all love ourselves. It's not so much about self-esteem. We don't need self-esteem. We don't need to look in the mirror and think, you look great, you're a legend. Yeah. It's not that kind of love. That, sort of, that is creeping into the church now, isn't it? How to yeah. feel great about yourself and 10 steps to great self-esteem and all that stuff, isn't it? That's sort of yeah. creeping in quite big now. But we already love ourselves in the sense that we dress ourselves, we um, give ourselves food, we give ourselves water and shelter. That's what it means to, when we love ourselves already. We already do that. We don't have to try to love ourselves before we can love others. We already do that. It's not about self-esteem. So to love others just means to put them before us. Yeah. That's what it means. Amen, Jacko. OK, uh, Jack and Dad, I find your reasoning about suffering a bit disturbing. When you get to heaven, you will see how wonderful it is compared to being on earth. Um, this sounds very human. The reason bad things happen is thanks to Adam and the introduction of sin. Thank you so much. If you'd listened long enough, you probably would have heard me talk about Adam and sin and the fall of creation and the fall of man. So, yes. couldn't agree more. But it's like even in Genesis 50, talking about the life of Joseph, he was a righteous man and he suffered so much. Yet, like I said earlier, it says God was with him. He doesn't leave us in our suffering. God was with him. But also it says in Genesis 50 that what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. Yeah. It's the same in our lives. Satan means things for evils. He wants to steal, kill and destroy. He wants our destruction. God does not want our destruction. He wants us to have eternal life. So what Satan means for evil in our life, God means for good. God means for good. Absolutely. Maggie says, hi guys. God gave Adam and Eve dominion over the earth and everything in it. They promptly gave their allegiance to Satan, giving him their dominion. Um, that's why everything is going pear-shaped in this world. We are sinners, but Jesus is buying us back one by one. I love that. The, the kingdom of God just increasing one by one by one. God loves us that much. Jesus is coming back soon to once again take full possession of his world from Maggie. What do you think of that, Jack? One by one, the kingdom is coming, isn't it? Yeah, and 
I was reading a book by Dr. Michael Brown, and he was saying we don't need to be pessimistic. You know, in the West, we think that just the church is in decline, and in the West it is, but actually there's probably more Christians on earth now than ever have been. God's kingdom has always persevered through the ages, despite all of Satan's plans. God's kingdom is growing and growing and growing, and eventually it'll be fully manifested. Jesus will return and he'll reign on the earth with everyone here who loves him. Jack, do you think it's wrong? Because I often, I often can't wait for the end. Not, not my end, or, or I, I just can't wait for it all to the, the end of the age and, and the Lord to come back and, and you know, for this to end. Because this, life is our work, and I, I've got it easy compared to nine tenths of the world because I'm not starving to death. I've got a roof over my head. You know, I've, I've got a, a lovely wife and, and kids, and I couldn't be more blessed. But I know I find life, life hard work. Yeah. I think it's wrong, Jack, to actually... I'm not preoccupied with the Lord coming back, but I really can't wait. Do you think it's wrong to actually wish this away? I can't remember where it is, you might know, but it says somewhere in the New Testament, look into and hastening the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, Christ. the hastening, yeah. And even in Revelation 22, right at the end it says, um, you know, I'll read it actually, it's a really good passage, right at the end of the Bible, the last chapter. It says, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. So we want people to come to the water of life and we want Jesus to return. And it says in verse 20, he who testifies through these things says, surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Yeah. So we want Jesus to return. Yeah. Because his return means the end of suffering. Yeah. It means the end of sin. It means righteousness is brought into the earth at long last. So I think as Christians, we should be looking to his return and hastening that day. Yeah, hasten that day. I like that. Thanks, Jack. Got a lovely one here from Dee. Hi, Mark and Jack. Really love the show. Your son is a blessing. I pray that my daughter finds a lovely son like Jack. It's beautiful to see such a young man serving God. God bless from Dee. Thank you, Dee. Lovely little words. Lovely little words. I think the atmosphere in heaven is going to be amazing. The love of God will permeate, saturate heaven. It will flow freely, no resistance. And because God is there and he is love and his presence will be fully manifest, his love shall be fully manifest in us. At his right, up, right hand are pleasures forevermore. Sounds great, Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. Come, Lord Jesus. Um, Marion, thank you for the show. I really look forward to it and love the subjects because they're always in the word. Bless you, Marion. Thank you for your discussions and the points that Jack explains. Quite inspired. By the way, wow, sorry, I got this one wrong. By the way, Horatio Spafford lost four daughters but not his wife. Wow, thank you, Marion. Many blessings to, blessings to you both and thank you for blessing us for you, for you through your ministries. Do you know what, Marion? We just thank God that we're here every week, don't we, Jack? We just, we feel blown away that we get this opportunity just literally in an informal way to share the word of God. And someone just says, I love your passion, Mark. And I love your wisdom, Jack. There you go, Jacko. Brilliant. Next point. Yes, one of the last points is that love fulfills the law. And we know in the Old Testament there were 613 commands. We're not under them because Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. He's already fulfilled it. It's already done. So that means God is not judging us against his standard of the law. Because if we're in Christ as believers, we're dead to the law like Christ is dead to it because he died. And we've risen again to new life. And now the Bible says we're no longer under law, but under grace. But because we're no longer under law and under grace, and that we're new creations, God's law is written on our hearts. What does that mean in practice for us to live out the law? And Jesus says clearly that he's asked, what are the most important commandments? And he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, and to love your neighbour as yourself. And he's quoting there Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And people think that in the Old Testament, God was a God of wrath, and in the New Testament, a God of love. It's not true at all. Even in the Old Testament, love God, love your neighbour. Mm. First four commandments out of the ten are loving God, and then other six are loving your neighbour. So that's what it means. If you want to, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And if you want to obey Jesus' commandments, love God, love your neighbour. Whatever that looks like in your situation, do it. Love God and love your neighbour. And... Um, that's massive. That is, isn't it? Yeah. Was it six, six um, commandments about loving your neighbour and four for loving God? Yeah. The summation, the, the consummation of that is that if you do that, walking in the spirit, 
led by the Spirit, really, you're going to walk righteously because you won't, you won't want to covet your neighbour's BMW 3 Series, you know, or, or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It's just yeah. going to be a natural outflowing of perfect love, loving God and loving your neighbour. Okie dokie. Um, oh, that one's disappeared. Where's that one gone? That looked quite interesting, that one. There we go. Already seen Marion. And Pat says, Hi all. If we could love our enemies, there's a possibility that you wouldn't have had to have dined for us. We would, have, we would have to be perfect. Would we be, have to be perfect to love our enemies? From Pat. Um, what do you reckon, Jack? Because in our fallen sin, sinful state, it's, it's impossible, isn't it, surely, to love our enemies? Unless um, you're quickened by the Spirit. I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. Jesus does say that even, you know, the, the wicked know how to do good things. But there is also a passage, um, I'm not sure it's in my notes, but it basically says, Jesus is saying to love your enemies. And he's saying, even the wicked know how to love mm. their family and their children. What good is it to you just be the same, but love your enemies and expect nothing in return? So there, I think Jesus is suggesting that loving your enemies is something that more Christians do and non-Christians don't. I think non-Christians can still do good things for their enemies, but it might not necessarily be driven out of an actual love for their enemies, but rather something else. Maybe it is, it's good for them, it makes them feel good. But I'm not 100% sure, but definitely if you're looking at general patterns of life, Christians are called to love their enemies, by nature, people don't do that. Wow. I've got a heavy one here, Jack. Um, I came to Christ after my dad was murdered. The Lord's love is so great. He showed me forgiveness of my sin and taught me forgiveness of, of whoever was, were the perpetrators. His love is relief, releasing into forgiveness of others. Be blessed, both of you. Your opening of the word is just wonderful. Jack, we're sitting here talking about small beans compared to this, this beautiful person. What a situation to have had to go through, Jack, and what a tight, constricted road. Narrow is the road that leads, you know, to eternity. And this dear, beautiful person is walking a real, a real tough walk. And that's where you can see that God doesn't just save people, he changes people. Because that's yeah. not according to the flesh. That's spiritual. Yeah. That's of God to forgive someone of that. Yeah. Um, right, we're literally down to our last two minutes, Jack. And I want to say, um, Phyllis in Hertfordshire, thank you so much for your lovely words. Really, really beautiful. Thank you so much. Very uplifting. And we're just down to our last minute and a half, Jack. Hi, I'm so worried about my adult son. Sometimes after praying and reading the word, I feel at peace, but then feel guilty as it doesn't seem right being at peace when he's in such a way. God bless you. Wow. Do you want, Jack, would you just pray for this young man, this adult son, this person's adult son, just pray for this young man that the word of the Lord would give him peace. Lord, we thank you that we can have peace in all situations and peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, we, pr we pray that you'd encourage this person to pray, to give it over to you, to put this person's life in your hands, because when it's in your hands, we know we can have peace. So please intervene in this situation, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I'm just reminded of that lovely scripture, I'll keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on me. And that's God talking. And Lord, I just ask now that you would keep all of our minds upon you in these uh, angst-inducing times and, the, and these very changeable times. Lord, would you keep our minds on you and your good news, uh, the only good news really in the world that is, that is worth anything and it is an eternal worth. And we're so grateful that you bestowed it upon us, Lord, and to all people that will come to you in penitence and faith. Jack, thank you so much for being here tonight. Absolutely loved it. By God's grace, we'll be back next week, so get studying again. Guys out there, lovely to be in your company tonight, okay? Keep looking up, your redemption draws nigh. God bless.